Well, if you'll turn with me uh, to Luke's Gospel, chapter 1. Starting in verse 57. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him Zechariah after his father, but his mother answered, No, he shall be called John. And they said to her, None of your relatives is called by that name. And they made signs to his father, inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, His name is John. And they all wondered, and immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed, and he spoke, blessing God. And fear came on all their neighbors. And all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid up in their hearts, saying, What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. And his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he was in the wilderness until the day of his public appearance in Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this word this morning, and we ask that you would open our eyes and our hearts, unite our hearts to fear your name. Lord, we do know that the grass withers, the flower fades as we look out and fall and winter, we see the browning of things and the falling of leaves. But your word never returns void or empty. It never fades. Lord, may the glory of this word to us, the word made flesh, grow ever more brighter and spectacular in our lives. Lord, we pray this for your glory and for our good and joy. Amen. All right, I want you to try and imagine this, and and for those in this room, I I know this is just imagination, but try to imagine being unable to speak, even utter a a single word, even make a sound whatsoever. Now, I know for some of you introverts, you might enjoy that, or at least enjoy somebody that's in your house having that ability uh, to not say anything, but I don't think you would wish it for nine months straight. That was the case for Zechariah. He had been visited by the angel Gabriel and given the the startlingly wonderful news that his prayers have been heard and that his wife would conceive and bear a son, that they would name him John and that he, that Zechariah, would have joy and gladness. But he doubted what he was told. And the sign that was given to him by the angel that everything would actually happen, that it would all take place. What he doubted was that he would be mute until everything came to be, and and perhaps even deaf, because if you look at verse 62, they had to make signs to get his attention. So I wonder if he could even hear at that time. But now the time has come. Those months are up. His wife is about to bear a son, and surely, I, I would imagine, in those ensuing months... He searched the scriptures. He sought the Lord and his wisdom. He has longed for meaning and for the significance of this birth. Gabriel already told him sensational things about this child. If we went back to chapter 1, verse 15, Gabriel said, He will be great before the Lord. He must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. 
He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Amazing words that are given. And surely as Zechariah pondered and prayed about those things, that welling up led to the text we're at this morning. Here we're going to look briefly at the birth of Zechariah's son, but mainly we're going to look at the outburst of prophetic praise that came from a tongue that was loosed by the Lord. This is an inspiring song. The Benedictus is a glorious text that reveals the heart of one who knew at least some, at least some of the gravity of what was coming to fruition at that time. All right, look then at verse 57. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. Now as the things anticipated came to pass, the town, the relatives and neighbors, they're all rejoicing over the mercy of God shown to Elizabeth. In verse 58, it says that the Lord had shown great mercy to her. This is the Lord, you, you could write it as the Lord magnifying his mercy, or the Lord making great his mercy towards her. And Elizabeth is really seeing, you know, a, a smidgen of the mercy of the merciful God, and yet it is great. It is magnificent mercy and the people are witnesses of that mercy. It's a stunning scene. The, a scene this, this older couple, the, the couple, this formerly barren woman, is now holding her son. And then came the eighth day, the day of circumcision and the day when the child would be named. Now, the people rightly at this point in time, according to, to tradition, figured he's going to be called Zechariah. Keep the family name. But Elizabeth is adamant. Verse 60, no, he shall be called John. And there's shockwaves. There's absolutely no precedent for this. No history of the name John in the family line. So the people make signs to get Zechariah's attention in order to figure out whether this is really the name. And after acquiring a writing tablet, he writes down very succinctly, his name is John. And the text says that they all wondered at this. You know, perhaps before John or Zechariah wrote this, perhaps they thought Elizabeth simply liked the name John better. Maybe she was trying to pull a fast one on, pull a fast one on her husband who hadn't talked to her for nine months, and she was just a little mad at it, the whole thing, and said, I'm not calling him Zechariah, I just want him to be named John. But he makes it very clear at this point, no. His name's John, and he shows conviction and confidence. He and Elizabeth were completely together on this. He doesn't say he will be called John because his name has been John before the conception ever took place. Gabriel told him what the name of this child would be. God gave him his name. And no lack of precedence in the family would ever change that fact. John means Jehovah is gracious. Jehovah is gracious, and God has been gracious. And John's ministry, his future ministry, will reflect his name. His ministry will be about the gracious God calling his people to turn back, to turn away from sin, and to look to the coming Savior. Well, then look at verse 64. And immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue loosed, and he spoke, blessing God. The first thing Zechariah did upon being able to speak was to bless God. It was to praise. And of course, his ability to speak now brings reverent fear upon everyone for for good reason. You can imagine that. Wonder at really what is going on? What is this child going to be? Because, see, this was not normal. None, None of this was normal. Okay, it's not normal for an older, barren woman to have a child. It is not normal for a dude to not be able to speak and possibly even hear for nine months and then all of a sudden burst forth in prophetic praise. It's not natural 
because it is absolutely supernatural. It is the work of God. The work of the Lord for a grand purpose, verse 66, the hand of the Lord was with him. And the hymn there is John. He was filled with the Spirit of God from conception, in the womb. And his life will be lived in the pursuit and glory of God. He will be the great prophet of the Lord. I love how John the Apostle describes this John in his gospel. John 1, verses 6 to 8. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. If there was ever a wonderful description of someone, I think that's it. How would you like to be described as, he's not the light, his whole life is to bear witness to the light. What an aspiration for us is to be those who bear witness of the light. John was a massively integral player in God's redemptive plan. But it was God's plan, and this is, this is all, at this point, it's, it's just too much for Zechariah to handle. I mean, the guy has not been able to speak for nine months. It's overwhelming, and, and he cannot contain his praise, and so he burst forth into absolute prophetic song. And as we look at this song, it's broken down into two distinct sections. There's really only two sentences in the original Greek, verses 68 to 75 and 76 to 79. And the first is about the fulfillment, about the child yet to be born. And the second section is about John. It's about the forerunner to that fulfillment, the one who will prepare the way of the Lord. So look at verse 68. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. There, you, there it is, right? Praise. It's, it's, it's blessing. It's thanksgiving. God is worthy of our thanks and of our blessing. And this reflects Scripture, surely what he has been in for nine months. The ends of books one, two, and four of the Psalter, they all end with blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, as they recount God's work amongst his people. You see, when we recall what the Lord has done, the natural response is praise. It's thanksgiving. It's blessing God. And then we continue, it continues, for he has visited and redeemed his people. Now, visited his people. That term carries the idea of, of coming to someone to help, to, to look after, to oversee on their behalf. It's not the idea of saying, oh, I, I visited the zoo this weekend, or I visited the museum. Not that you just went to see or, or something along those lines, but it's more along the lines of, uh, of visiting to help, to, to actually work for someone. I remember when my grandfather was in a nursing home. Our visits were, they were not strictly to see him, I mean, that was the, the main purpose, but we went to visit him to be an advocate, to make sure he was cared for, to make sure maybe the orderlies weren't stealing from him or things along those lines. We went to work for him. It was an active visit. It was not passive. We didn't just go to see him. We went to see him, to visit, to work for him. So when the people of God thought about the visit of God, they knew that it was not just a passive, he's coming, hey, how's it going? All right, see ya. It's actually coming to work for them. They looked forward to that because when the visits were of blessing, it meant good for them. Exodus chapter 4, verse 31, and the people believed, and when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshiped. Moses had come back from, from being in Midian, and he tells of God says, calling him to free the people. And they go, yes, the Lord has visited. The Lord has worked. Because that visitation led to the entire exodus, the, the freedom of God's people from bondage in Egypt, from the oppression of their enemies. 
So this is the line of visit that Zechariah is speaking of. It is a visit to work redemption. He visited and redeemed. He visited and accomplished redemption for them. It's the fulfillment of a promise. Psalm 111.9, he sent redemption to his people, for he has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. He sent redemption because that's what his covenant was. The covenant with Abraham as he made it and he walked through on behalf of both parties and said, if either one of us break this, I let the punishment be upon me. And that's what's about to happen through this child yet to be born. Folks, it's a complete redemption. It's a complete redemption. It affects all of life. At, At the root of redemption... Uh, the, the, the word redemption means to experience a liberation from oppression, from an oppressive situation. And the, the most significant aspect of that word is eternal in nature. It deals with our sin, with our rebellion against the Lord. Hebrews 9, 12, He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of His own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. He has visited and redeemed his people. See, this work was what the Old Testament visitations of the Lord to work redemption foreshadowed. The plague of the firstborn where the angel of the Lord passed over the houses covered by the blood of the Lamb. That's a foreshadowing of the blood of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And it all takes on a more brilliant beauty when you see how everything is tied together in God's covenant purposes. The scriptures come alive more and more. Yet, folks, there's still much more to this song. He writes that the Lord God has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Horn of salvation, we don't use that phrase. We don't use the phrase, he's raised up a horn. Horn means power. It's a symbol of power. Psalm 18, verses 1 to 3. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. You hear that language of strength throughout that psalm. Horn is the power of God, and it is the power of God specifically applied and done towards salvation. And it's a horn of salvation in the line of David. And here again, you see the the fulfillment of the covenant promise made specifically to David, this aspect of the covenant of grace. And as we continue, this is spoken, he he says, by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old. Folks, this was not new. This was not new. Zechariah found this throughout the scriptures, throughout the Hebrew scriptures. What we would call the Old Testament is the picture of the coming of Christ. And when you think about the prophets, the, the environment to which the prophets wrote, So often they spoke of people of God experiencing oppression from enemies. They were burdened. They were beat down. So you read verse 71, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us. The people under the hand of a foreign government, mighty foes, but he says, but the horn of salvation is stronger. It is greater because it's the horn of the Lord It's the Messiah. It's this baby yet to be born to a virgin from Nazareth. But folks, God did not merely um, fulfill this to save us from our enemies. But, verse 72, to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all our days. Folks, here again we see the mercy of God. To show the mercy promised to our fathers. Listen, this, if you get one thing today, God loves to show mercy. 
He loves to do it. He, he delights to do it, to be glorified in doing so. It just as he sets forth his name, the Lord, the Lord God, a God compassionate and merciful, abounding in love. All right, Isaiah 30, verse 18, listen to this. Therefore, the Lord waits to be gracious to you. And therefore, he exalts himself to show mercy to you. God exalts himself to show mercy to you. The NAS says, he waits on high to have compassion on you. God delights to be merciful. Do you believe that? I know sometimes it's hard because those who are parents, we don't always delight to be merciful. We want justice. We want our kids to do what's right. But the Lord delights to be merciful. D does he want justice? Yes. And that justice is meted out in his son so that he can be merciful to us. That he can be just and the justifier of those who have faith in Christ Jesus. The Lord shows his mercy toward us so that we can serve him, so that we can worship him without fear, in holiness and righteousness, freed from the guilt and the weight of our sin. See, he does all that is needed for us to be able to worship him through the horn of salvation, through this child in the line of David. He has given us all that we need for life and for godliness. And how we need to, know, to, to, to get to know him deeply enough to trust upon and to rely upon him in all of life. Knowing that he delights in this. We need to take to heart more and more these words from Romans 8. Starting in verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you believe that? Folks, that's what the Lord who delights to show mercy has for us. He loves his children. He delights in us. This is the Lord who remembers his oath, his covenant, the oath he swore to Abraham. If you think again about Abraham, that the covenant's made, and then what does he ask Abraham to do? He says, Abraham, take your son, your only son, and sacrifice him to me. And Abraham goes to do it. And I can't imagine that walk with your son Hey, Dad, we got the wood. Where's the sacrifice? And his response, Abraham doesn't lie. I think he says it with faith, the Lord will provide. And he goes and he's ready to do it. And the Lord stops him and intervenes and there's a ram in the thicket. The Lord provided and, and God says, 
In Genesis 22, by myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this, and you have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore, and your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Folks, Abraham did not withhold his son, his only son, but the Lord intervened. But this child to be born that Zechariah prophesies about the Lord would not withhold him, and he would not intervene. He would pour out his wrath upon his own son so that we could have life. He would be the sacrifice for his people. And Zechariah is reminding us of this promise and the nature of the God who makes and keeps those promises. And if you, if you went back to the very beginning of Luke's gospel, he says that he writes to this Theophilus so that he would have certainty of all the things written, of all the things taught about God and about sin and salvation, about the covenant promises. We are to have certainty in this. The author of Hebrews also wanted his readers to be sure, to see that the Messiah, that Jesus Christ is supreme over all things, and that we can have a sure hope. If you turn to Hebrews 6, verses 13 to 20, we see the author speak of this oath of the covenant and why it's so important. Verse 13, for when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath, so that by two unchangeable things, that being God and his promise and oath, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. And we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf. Folks, why is all this so important? Because this is where our hope is built. His oath, his covenant, his blood, Support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Folks, the the promise of God, and, and really more truly, it's the God who makes that promise. He's our hope our rock, our joy, our peace, our refuge. Because the world around us and and our world is often painful and oppressive and difficult and strained and uncertain. We're, We're thankfully, I think, coming out of uncertainty, but maybe going back into it, who knows? We've been living in this limbo of a pandemic ish thing for two years almost. That's uncertain. But then there's the pain of a lost job, of a family member who maybe is really struggling with life, of lost hopes and dreams, of sickness, of just strife and relationships, stress, anxiety that we all feel. But we have strong encouragement to hold on to the God of hope, the God who delights to show mercy to his children. That's the fulfillment. And then Zechariah turns to the forerunner, his baby boy. Verse 76, and you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. Here's John's role. 
to prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He is to give knowledge of salvation, to show them that salvation comes through faith and repentance. It comes through the forgiveness of sins. It does not come through our works of the law. And then we, again, we come across one of the most beautiful phrases in all of Scripture, verse 78. Because, so purpose, because of the tender mercy of our God. The tender mercy of our God. Because really, the the phrase is, the bowels of his mercy. It's welling up. He can feel it. He feels merciful towards us. In 1 John 3.17, we read, But if anyone has the world's good and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? The word heart there, closes his heart, is the same word that's translated as tender. This heart of mercy, this heart of compassion, this, this no, it's, it's, it's bursting towards us. God's heart, folks, is one of mercy and compassion. So because of that tender mercy of our God, it's God's unfailing mercy, God's steadfast love. Wish that you all would Memorize these words, at least know where they are, from Lamentations, chapter 3. God's steadfast love, starting in verse 21. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Folks, this all is the visit of the sunrise from on high. The mercy, the steadfast love of God gives light to those in darkness. Darkness that we feel on so many levels. In particular, the darkness of our hearts in sin, but also the darkness of life, the pain, the difficulty, even the despondency that some of us feel. The light guides our feet into the way of peace. Surely, Zechariah read Isaiah 9, verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. Or Malachi chapter 4, verse 2. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. It's not just the forgiveness of our sins, but healing and life and light in the darkness. The light of Christ brings peace that is both objective and subjective. Objective, yes, in that our sins are dealt with. We are reconciled to God. We are adopted as children, as sons into the family of God, and subjectively we experience it. There's freedom from the curse of the law, freedom from from the burden, from the weight of the law on us. We take his yoke upon us, and that frees our hearts and our minds, and we are assured and comforted by the very fact that we are adopted by the God of the universe. So folks, here's Zechariah's song. That's beautiful. But let's ponder just for a moment what we can take away from this. So not, the Holy Spirit will surely guide better than I will. Here's, here's, when I think about this song, I think about the faithfulness of God. The covenant of God. God has never failed to keep his covenant. He continually remembers. He cannot forget it. In fact, he cannot not keep his covenant. He cannot fail to love his children. He cannot not have mercies that are new every morning. He cannot fail in steadfast love. He absolutely delights to show his children mercy and steadfast love. And the difference that should make 
should be monumental. We should, here I raise my Ebenezer, I'm going to mark this spot and I'm going to remember that for the rest of my days. But doggone it, I know it's hard. Because we leave here and life hits again. This is an oasis in the storm, in the desert. But we have to continue to seek to remember. We are so distracted and so pulled away from this truth in our lives. But let us be people who resist that pull. And, and dive deep into who God is, into his everlasting love and his steadfast love and his, his delighting to show mercy. Let us be people who encourage one another in that so that we can serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness all our days. Because he is where our hope rests, where it's built. Folks, if we build it anywhere else, it will fail absolutely guaranteed. But it will never fail with the Lord. And I'm not saying life won't be difficult at times. That there won't be seasons. But joy comes in the morning. Joy comes. And the birth of Christ. The life of Christ. The death of Christ. The resurrection of Christ. The ascension of Christ. His being seated at the right hand of the Father interceding for his children absolutely guarantees that we will be with him for eternity. And that our life even here and now can be one that delights in the mercy of God. Let us know his tender mercy on the hope which never fails. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this word. Lord, be at work in our hearts and our minds. Grow us in you. May your tender mercy not just impact us now as we're together, but live on day in and day out, moment by moment. How faithful of a God you are. It's hard to fathom because we know how unfaithful we are. Grow our vision of you, our trust in you, our rest in you, our hope in you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.